official AIDS 2018 press briefing, our first of AIDS 2018, and I'm delighted that it's about prevention. I think that already says a very important uh, message we want to get out at this conference. My name is Linda Gale Becker. I'm president of the International AIDS Society and the International Scientific Chair of the 22nd International AIDS Conference, also known as AIDS 2018. I'm also a professor of medicine. I come from Cape Town and I work at the Desmond Tutu HIV Center. This briefing is being live streamed um, on the AIDS 2018 virtual conf uh, conference page and an archived recording will be available there afterwards. I'd like to extend a warm welcome, therefore, to those of you who are joining us from around the world. We're calling this briefing HIV Prevention Research Highlights. And um, I think there are some, some really terrific highlights. Today's press conference uh, will highlight five prevention stu uh, studies, including updates on the progress of HIV vaccines, uh, innovation in digital tracking technologies to improve PrEP, um, new data on the effectiveness of, of on-demand PrEP amongst MSM, data on potential interactions of PrEP and feminizing hormone therapy, as well as new research on the effectiveness of viral suppression for reducing HIV <coughs> transmission among men, gay, uh, gay male serodiscordant couples. These studies include, I think, cutting-edge research, uh, many of them late-breaking, that advance our, our knowledge on many fronts. And in, and, and in these cases, will have important real-world implications. They point the way towards our implementation uh, and practice in the field. I'm pleased to have several wonderful, world-renowned experts joining me here today to discuss this. Uh, because as the world's largest open gathering of HIV scientists, we know that our work provides the foundation for the global HIV response. So we're going to start to my left, uh, Dr. Frank Tamarco. Frank is the senior director at Janssen and the franchise clinical leader of HIV vaccines. He will present some encouraging news on the progress of HIV vaccine development. Over to you, Frank. Thank you, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I, I am Frank Tamaka, and I am the clinical leader of the HIV pro vaccine program at Janssen, which is part of Johnson & Johnson. And it's a great privilege for me to have this position. I started my career as a HIV treating physician for 15 years, and then 13 years ago went to development of antiretrovirals, and then six years ago had received this once in six lifetime opportunity to work on this vaccine with an amazing group of global partners. Um, just a little background on the, what we're setting out to do with our HIV preventive vaccine program. We want to develop a mosaic-based vaccine to prevent HIV um, of multiple strains or clades. Our goal is to develop a global vaccine and that this is what would happen if we could prevent multiple strains or, or clades. Um, mosaic vaccines refers to the immun immunogens or antigens, which are the molecules that induce the body's immune response. And these mosaic uh, Genes are created using genes from a variety of different strains or clades of HIV um, that circulate around the world. Today, what I'll be presenting at the at an 11 o'clock uh, oral symposium is the follow-up data post the vaccination period in the approach study. This was the first clinical study to investigate this vaccine concept was conducted in 393 healthy HIV negative adults in the US, Rwanda, Uganda, South Africa, and Thailand. The initial data, um, which was data from week 52, four weeks after the final and fourth vaccination, was presented at IAS, the initial uh, data, in 2017. 
A more detailed summary of this data is available in a manuscript that was uh, published in The Lancet earlier this month, and I would refer you to that for details up until week 52. So my presentation today is what's happened since the vaccination period in the year after the fourth vaccination. Um, this, is new, this new data provides the first insight into the durability or persistence of the immune responses induced by this uh, vaccine. Uh, the key findings are all mosaic regimens evaluated had a favorable safety profile. There were no unexpected vaccine-related AEs, and all regimens maintained robust humoral antibody and cellular immune responses, even after one year of follow-up. The most immunogenic of the different regimens that we tested in an approach was comprised of a mosaic viral factor called adenovirus 26, or AD26, as a double prime, and then boost with the same AD26 component with a high dose of a GP140 protein. This is an envelope protein on the HIV synthetically produced. All volunteers receiving this regimen achieved a robust antibody response which persisted one year post-vaccination. Also, a high proportion maintained a cellular immune response. So in summary, these data demonstrate durability or persistence of immune responses elicited by this mosaic vaccine regimen. The significance of this is this was key information for Janssen and our global partners to start the first large-scale efficacy trial of this vaccine concept in five sub-Saharan African uh, countries. This study started in November of 2017 and is called Invocoto. And this will test whether the vaccine prevents HIV infection compared to those who don't receive the vaccine or receive placebo. And the results are expected in 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Our next speaker is Jean-Michel Molina. Uh, Prof. Molina, well known to all of us, is head of the Infectious Diseases Department at the St. Louis Hospital in Paris, where he works with immunocompromised HIV patients. He'll speak to us about findings today from a real-world study of the use of on-demand Thank you, Linda Gvail. Uh, good morning, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here today and to give you some uh, uh, preliminary data of the presentation I'll make on Wednesday uh, on a study that is sponsored by the French Agency for AIDS Research, the NRS, which is called uh, Prevenir, meaning prevent in, in French. As you know, in France, um, we have uh, conducted the NRS Ipergay study a couple of years ago showing high efficacy of on-demand PrEP uh, to prevent HIV infection among MSM. Um, this dosing regimen uh, has been approved now in Europe. Uh, it's been endorsed by Australian, Canadian, uh, British guidelines, but not everyone is comfortable with this regimen. And uh, beyond the data from clinical trials, we wanted to provide additional data on real-world experience of this uh, on-demand dosing regimen for PrEP for MSM. The other objective of our study was also to show upscaling PrEP uh, in the Paris region, how we could have an impact on the HIV epidemic among MSM in, in Paris, because Paris is by far the most affected area by HIV in, um, in France. So we started the project a year ago. Our goal is to enroll 3,000 people, and people actually have the choice to uh, use PrEP either on demand or daily. So we present the two options, and the participants actually make their choices. And they could even switch from one regimen to another during follow-up. So at this conference, we are presenting the, the first data on the first 1,600 people and enrolled in the study to provide additional data on the efficacy and safety of these dosing regimen on demand. Interestingly, among the 1,600 people uh, enrolled, 46% opted for on-demand, 45 for daily. 
and all the time, most of them remain with their initial uh, regimen. Those using uh, on-demand PrEP had uh, fewer uh, sexual partners and fewer uh, cannibalized sex acts than those using daily. That's the only difference at baseline between the two groups. When we looked at the use of PrEP uh, during uh, sexual intercourse uh, over time, it's striking to see that um, when we assessed what we call the correct use of PrEP was the last sexual intercourse covered by PrEP, between, uh, meaning having peel before and peel after PrEP, uh, the vast majority, more than 96% uh, of the participants with both regimen uh, use PrEP very correctly at the correct uh, dosing. So that was encouraging, and that was probably due to the, the counseling uh, of these patients uh, benefited during their visit to the clinic. Uh, in addition, we've seen that 20% of these participants also use condoms, meaning that you could use PrEP and also condoms in combination. Um, and that's important in the current context of, of STIs. When we looked at the incidence of HIV in the two groups, uh, daily arm or on-demand arm, we didn't see any uh, right free infection so far. So that's remarkable, and that shows that the incidence of HIV in this cohort is actually zero today. Um, what's uh, also interesting was that the very low rate of uh, loss to follow-up, and the detection was very good. Only 3.3 per 100 person years in patients discontinue actually the study. And uh, if we uh, use the incidence of HIV we have observed during the Ipoge study in Paris, uh, these uh, great results will let us think that we have averted up to 85 new infections in these people. Uh, when we looked at uh, sexual behavior, uh, there was no major changes between the two groups. Um, and regarding the safety of the regimen, nothing remarkable between the two uh, dosing regimen. Again, uh, PrEP is very well tolerated in the only a few gastrointestinal adverse events. And during the study so far, no one actually discontinued the treatment PrEP because of a drug-related adverse event. So in summary, we think that this interim report of this open-label cohort study among MSM uh, strengthened the case for the use of on-demand PrEP for uh, people who want to use on-demand and who are not willing to be committed to a daily regimen. And I think this uh, opens an option for uh, men who would like to use this uh, on-demand regimen, and we hope that this will help upscale PrEP in this community because <coughs> we are still far from uh, reaching the number of people uh, that would need to be on PrEP in order to have a significant impact on the epidemic of the MSM in our country. And uh, I think I'll stop here, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jean-Michel. Uh, next, we're turning to Dr. Akarin Iran uh of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Institute. Uh, Akarin is the lead order of the IFACT study in Thailand, which examined the use of PrEP amongst transgender women and looked at potential interactions between PrEP and feminizing hormone therapy. Over to you. First of all, I would like to thank you, Dr. for taking over to be presented here in the press conference. Uh, we are very excited to have a chance to share this result with you all today. Um, so I think that, I was first, first off with the background, that I think it's an established fact by now that PrEP is among the effective method for HIV prevention. However, we, we began to have concerns over the efficacy of PrEP among transgender women because there's a, there are studies that show us that the blood concentration of PrEP among transgender women is lower compared to non-transgender population. Now, I think we can maybe categorize into main, two main possibilities. The first one is that transgender women did actually have good adherence to PrEP, but there was this previously unknown drug interaction between the fermenting hormones and, and PrEP. Or, or secondly, or, and quite simply, transgender women did have poor adherence to PrEP. Now, if that's the case, there's also a survey suggesting that it could be due to the fact that transgender women prioritized the use of feminizing hormones over PrEP. So this comes back to the same issue again in that, um, in the sense that people are concerned 
over whether or not there are really drug interactions between these two medications. So um, from, from that um, point on, we established a, a study called IFACT um, to determine um, whether there really are drug interactions between the use of amazing hormone therapy and antiretroviral agents. For today, I'm just going to talk about the part of PrEP. And I think right off the bat, the important thing that needs to be known is that feminizing hormone regimens can differ between each country. For us, what we use is estradiol valerate, which is a form of estrogen, plus ciprotrone acetate, which is a form of antiandrogen. Um, so uh, for the results of our study, we found that the blood hormones concentration was not affected by the use of PrEP. So this essentially means that you can use PrEP and feminizing hormone concurrently without the fear that PrEP will decrease the hormones level in your body to the suboptimal level. Now for the second part of our results, now this is a little bit uh, trickier. The result we found was that there's a 13% reduction in blood tenophobic exposure in the presence of feminizing hormone therapy. Um, while I think it's great that our studies have shown this um, previously unknown drug interactions between PrEP, um, tenofovir to be precise, with fermenting hormone therapy, there are definitely some key questions that need to be answered before moving forward with these results. Um, for instance, does this interactions also occur in cells or in target tissue, um, rectal tissue for example, which in most cases is the first site of HIV contact. Um, secondly, does this interaction also occur in other feminizing hormone regimens? And I cannot emphasize enough that feminizing hormone regimens can vary depending on the region you live in. And um, last but not least, the 13% reduction in tenophobia. We don't know whether this 13% reduction in blood tenophobia exposure in the presence of feminizing hormone therapies means anything regarding the preventive effect of PrEP. So there are still um, some, some questions that need to be answered before interpreting this um, result. And for further details of the study, I will be discussing it in the poster discussion this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Sarah Brown. Dr. Brown is an associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Diego, and president of specialists in global health. Dr. Brown is here to share findings from a study on digital PrEP, which could provide a new way to monitor PrEP adherence in real time. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting us to be able to present at this press conference. So as we've heard, HIV infection, and as you know, can be prevented by pre-exposure prophylaxis, and that currently consists of one tablet containing tenofovir and emtricyclopine combined in a drug called Truvada, which is recommended to be taken daily. Um, medication adherence, which means the extent to which a patient follows the instructions of a healthcare worker to actually take that medication daily, is considered crucial to providing protection from the infection. Um, we're really dealing in medication adherence with the old adage that medications don't work if patients don't take them. Uh, my group works in the area of medication adherence and there are a number of problems in this area. We really need reliable measures that are based on medication ingestion. Currently, clinical practice still relies uh, mostly on self-report, which is patient recall. Uh, we need to be able to have ways for healthcare workers to distinguish who needs support and who doesn't so that we can distribute resources appropriately. When we get that support, we really need support that comes in near real time. It's how useful is it when we discuss in the clinic what may or may not have happened a month ago. And then finally, and I think most important, these things really have to be patient empowerment tools. Patients need to have access to their own data. They need to be able to look at what they're doing, determine what kind of support they need, and share that with chosen healthcare uh, workers and uh, friends who can help support their medication taking habits so they can protect themselves from HIV infection. So our research works with a novel ingestion system that actually answers most of those needs. This system was developed by a company in Silicon Valley called Proteus Digital Health, and it is an ingestion sensor-based system uh, that we're, trying, we're using with oral prep. 
So briefly, how does the system work? There's this tiny ingestion sensor that's a millimeter by a millimeter by 0.45. Uh, it's composed of minerals such as those found in uh, vitamin supplements. The patient has to wear a monitor patch on the torso, and I can show you what that looks like. Uh, and they, they need a paired mobile device. So when the sensor is swallowed, it dissolves and communicates a unique code, similar to a barcode. This information is stored on the patch. Data is then transferred from the patch to the paired mobile device by Bluetooth technology and then subsequently from there relayed to secure servers using encryption code protocols similar to banking. So once this has happened, you can have people sign on to a secure website as long as they have patient permissions to access this data. And then they can view remotely how the patient's taking their medication. So we have been working with the system and we adapted it for oral prep. The first thing we had to do is actually combine the sensor with Truvada. And we did this in a very simple way using a technique called co-encapsulation. And this is um, where you put the sensor and Truvada in a gelatin capsule. So it's a very simple technique, but before you actually start using it in clinical trials and clinical practice, you have to make sure it's equivalent to native Truvada. So the bulk of the data in the poster presentation that will be up this morning discusses the PK results, which show that the the pharmacokinetic curves associated with the co-encapsulated formulation and that of native Truvada are equivalent. So what this means is yes, we can use it clinically and we can use it in clinical trials. So we currently have a clinical trial underway in a group of PrEP patients. In addition, the results we're presenting will show you uh, an example of how this technology can take longitudinal medication taking patterns and you'll be able to see the pattern of a patient that takes their medication very regularly, who clearly doesn't need a lot of support, and one whose medication-taking pattern is much more chaotic and would need more support. Finally, we have some data uh, which discusses how the patients have actually had a good experience with this system. So what are the important conclusions? Digital PrEP is available, and digital PrEP will allow real-time remote capture of medication ingestion for clinical this technology can provide longitudinal patterns of medication taking that will, can be used to facilitate differentiated care. And differentiated care, putting resources in the right place, is going to be crucial as we upscale PrEP. And finally, this near real-time data transfer means that you actually have near real-time adherence support, which is likely to be much more effective. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. The final speaker, Dr. Alison Roger, a senior lecturer in infectious and HIV at University College London and Clinical Director of Public Health at the Royal Free. She was the lead author of the previous observational study on HIV transmission among serodiscordant couples known as Partner One and she will now share compelling new findings from the follow-up study known as Partner Two which focused on gay male couples. So, Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased to be here today on behalf of the Partner Study Group uh, to present the results uh, from our late-breaking abstract that I'm actually presenting tomorrow, uh, looking at HIV transmission risk through anal sex and gay men uh, in the context of suppressive ART. So this is the Partner 2 study results. So Partner 2 is the largest study uh, to look at HIV transmission risk through condomless anal sex and gay men. Um, and although previous smaller studies, such as Partner 1 in 2016, and uh, opposites attract, did report <coughs> zero cases of HIV transmission in gay men. The level of evidence for gay men remains less than that for heterosexual couples, really due to the fact that we haven't accumulated enough couple years of follow-up in gay men. So the aim of the second phase of the partner study, partner two, was really to look at within couple HIV transmission risk through uh, anal sex during periods when condoms weren't used um, and the positive partner was on suppressive ART. So partner two study recruited and followed uh, almost a thousand gay zero different couples, so one positive in ART and one HIV negative, from 14 countries in Europe. And during that time we accumulated almost 1,600 couple years of follow-up. And in order to have eligible couple years of follow-up, you had to meet certain criteria. So the HIV negative partner had to test at the beginning and the end of the period of time. Positive partner had to be suppressed at all time points during that period. The couples had to have had condomless sex, and the negative partner didn't use PEP or PrEP during that time period. 
So just a couple of key results. Um, during follow-up, both the HIV negative and positive partners had STIs uh, and about 20% uh, of follow-up time. Um, couples had open relationships. One third of HIV negative men had partners in addition to their main study partner in a third of cases. And couples had condomless sex a median of 42 times per year, so that was three or four times per month. But over the entire follow-up period, we uh, accumulated approximately 77,000 condomless sex acts, which is a significant number. And in the absence of antiretroviral therapy, we would have expected a very significant number of transmissions to have occurred. So while 15 of the HIV negative men did become HIV positive during follow-up, by looking at the genetic characteristics of the virus using phylogenetic sequencing, we could very clearly see that their HIV infection had not come from their HIV positive partner on suppressive ART. So due to the very large study size, the precision and confidence we now have around this estimate of zero uh, is dramatically improved such that the very worst case scenario, so the outer limits of the confidence interval, are really you'd have to have condomless anal sex for almost 420 years to even have one transmission. Um, and that is the absolute worst case scenario. Um, so I think in conclusion, Partner 2 study was specifically designed to find out whether HIV transmission could even occur in gay men when the viral load suppressed. And despite couples having sex without condoms 77,000 times, we find no cases of within couple HIV transmission. So I think partner two data provides robust evidence for gay men that the risk of HIV transmission with suppressive ART is effectively zero um, and supporting the message of the U equals U campaign. And I do have to pay tribute to Prevention Access Campaign for effectively promoting the science behind partner two and other transmission studies so effectively. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Those are impressive numbers, I'm sure you'll agree, and quite a challenge uh, put out there. So we'll take questions from the